Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast produced in Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, my own website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 26 in our series for 2022, and today's date is Friday, July the 29th. First, I'll be talking to Brandon Buck, the president of CCT, the makers of the Easy Lid, the first jar lid innovation in over 75 years. The lid allows consumers to vent a jar by simply press a button, the lid which opens a tiny slit that breaks a seal. Believe it or not, there are about a third of consumers who struggle to open jar lids. While a stubborn, vacuum-sealed jar lid might be a minor inconvenience to some, it can be a major struggle for others with disabilities or physical limitations. The future of packaging is dependent on inclusive adaptation, and CCT is leading the charge. And I'll be talking to economist Saul Leslake. But now, let's talk to Brandon Buck. Brandon, tell us about Easy Lid. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so my name is Brandon Buck. I'm the president of CCT, or Consumer Convenient, Convenience Technologies, and we're the makers of the Easy Lid. Uh, and what the Easy Lid is, is it's a software design technology that reduces the amount of vacuum setting uh, within a, vac- or a vacuum sealed jar, making it 50% easier to open that jar lid. So what we've been able to accomplish is we've actually uh, incorporated a button onto the top of your of your jar lid that when the consumer pushes the button, it releases the vacuum, which in turn makes it 50% easier to open uh, up the, uh, those standard, or excuse me, those stubborn jars. For example, in the pasta sauce or pickles. Um, so that way uh, it'll, it'll make that product easier to open for those that need it. So this is mainly for food stuffs. Uh, correct. Uh, a- any any jarring uh, package uh, that uses a, a vacuum sealed to keep that product fresh. Yes. So how did you work out the technology for this? Well, there there are two uh, founding partners, James Bach and Pete Stodd. Pete Stodd, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but he was actually in the beer and beverage industry, and, and his other companies, their product is used worldwide. Uh, and, and they understood how to score uh, into that aluminum, uh, into the aluminum products. So with that being said, Pete was at a, a function, uh, a work function, and, and one of his uh, co-workers, uh, wives, come up to Pete and, and asked him, you know, hey, Pete, you're a smart guy. I, I just had to go through and I'm dealing with some uh, cancer issues. Uh, she was unfortunately going through a uh, breast cancer treatment. So she said it left her very weak and unable to open jars and, and posed the question to Pete, you know, hey, you're a smart guy. Can you figure out a way to, to, to open up jars easier? Uh, so that then spurred on this eight to 10 year adventure where uh, Pete joined forces with, uh, with, with James Bach. And, uh, and we've been moving uh, uh, toward, this, to the, uh, toward this day ever since. Uh, now, I believe you spent uh, something like seven years of research into this. Is that right? Uh, uh, yes, that is correct. So, so when we first set out, uh, you know, obviously uh, the, the, the current lid that's used in the market is 10 plate. So with that being said, we wanted to incorporate this technology already uh, with a product that was out into the market. Um, so that we actually used over 40 different scoring tools uh, to try and accommodate and make the easy lid work on the 10 plate. And we just kept running into a few areas that was making our production line way too long in order to, to produce the easy lid out of 10 plate. You know, one of those things that we were working with was just trying to not score all the way through the lid, you know, so that way we were not messing with a hermetic seal. Uh, just with the, the, the toughness with steel, the corrosion. After about seven, eight years of, of, of research and development, we decided that we were going to have to change the industry uh, and not add to it by moving to an, an aluminum lid. So the easy lid right now we are making, uh, it's an all in aluminum lid, which we feel, you know, which also brings into the, to the conversation more sustainable uh, you know, we know the benefits with aluminum, so we just felt that that gave us even more benefits to the easy lid moving forward. Right. Okay. Because uh, tin tin's actually problematic, isn't it, for the environment? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. We 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 found many challenges with trying to incorporate 
uh, the easy lid technology onto that tin plate lid. Right, and it just did not work with tin at all. Uh, no, uh, we were able to make it uh, to work, but we did run across, to, you know, like a, like I was, because what we were doing, we were actually scoring into the to the lid itself. Uh, so whether it was the tin plate lid or our aluminum lid, we are actually making the lid. And then from there, we are then stamping the lid, repurposing or moving the material around to form that button. So we're not adding any extra pieces or parts to the lid. So with aluminum being, you know, more malleable, but also its durability. I mean, you know, aluminum is used in space flight and, you know, and all sorts of things. So it just, it was a better product for us to use and to get the performance and the benefits that, that we feel uh, that the consumer deserves uh, just worked way better with, with the, the aluminum than it did the tin plate. Well, of course, the obvious thing about aluminum is it's, it's lightweight. Correct. It's lightweight and it's, and it's, it's corrosion resistance, isn't it? So that means you can recycle it, which you can't right. do with steel. Correct. Or I've never seen steel being actually recycled. Right. Well, like uh, what we like to say is that that the aluminum is definitely more desirable to be <laughs> to be uh, to to be uh, recycled. But yeah, I mean that, that was definitely one of the major benefits when we were trying to make the decision on whether to to keep trying to to make this work on the steel or to move into the aluminum arena. And, and that was definitely a, a big benefit for us to move into aluminum. Well, the big question though too, Brendan, is how much have has the industry taken to it? Uh, well, we definitely feel that the industry has taken to it. One of the, 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 the couple of the things that we have also been working through right now, which everyone has been, is, is obviously the pandemic uh, and, 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 and working through those situations, especially right now with you know, the grocery stores and the fillers trying to keep the product onto the shelves. So you know, we, we are seeing right now a lot of interest uh, worldwide. Uh, it's just working with those with those companies, those brands uh, on their timeline to ensure uh, that you know that we're not disrupting uh, you know them trying to get their product onto the store shelf. Uh, we are actually working with uh, a couple customers right now uh, where we will be rolling out uh, the Easy Lid on their product at the start of uh, 2023. So it's just a matter of working with those companies, those vendors, those fillers, those brands. Uh, and their timelines, and because everyone's uh, uh, timelines, everyone's supply chains has has been affected by this, and and the only thing that we can do is, is just keep moving forward with with the companies and their and their timeline, and uh, to try and get this to the market, because we do feel that it's very beneficial. Uh, you know, like here in the U.S. alone, with the the 19% of the population that has some sort of disability, or the 15% of the population that's 65 and older. I mean, that represents over a hundred million people just in the U.S. that could benefit greatly from this technology. Um, so, so we definitely feel that it's a benefit. I would imagine for those companies that take it on, it would probably increase their sales, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, absolutely. So, so one of the things that we have done throughout this process, part of our R&D research, uh, is we actually took the Easy Lid. Uh, it, it was added to a, a, a brand, a product, and it was put into 19 grocery stores uh, in a Pennsylvania area. And then we, we, we then conducted a case study. We were expecting a 30 to 40% increase in sales when the 16 week trial was completed. We actually couldn't keep the product on the shelf. We ran out four times. Um, we ended up with an increase in sales of over 341%. Over what period of time? Uh, 16 weeks. 341% over 16 weeks. Correct. We, we actually, and it probably would have been higher. At one point, we were up over 700% and we ran out. We, we, the filler, and we, we could not keep the product on the shelf. You know, again, because, you know, you don't have to have some sort of disability or whatever. I mean, I struggle opening jars, you know, you know, everyone has that. We all know someone in our family that, that struggles, uh, you know, and, and we always hear like, oh, well, that's why I have this gadget or I bought this to help me open these jars. Well, why not give that opening option within the product that you're selling? So someone A doesn't have to go buy another product or B go look for that product and then allow them to focus on the main things or the important things uh, with family time. You know, obviously, uh, it's very important, uh, you know, as opposed to trying to be frustrated on how do you open, you know, the jar or, or who do I need to ask to open this jar? So, I mean, and all it, all it takes is just 
pushing a button. Correct. So yeah, you don't you don't have to squeeze the thing or anything like that. Oh well, so 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 how it'll work? Uh, I mean, the lid is just like your standard template lid today, except the easy lid has the button. So just like you said, you will push the the button until you hear a click. So what that's doing is it's releasing the vacuum, and then you will still have to twist the jar lid off. But it's now fifty percent easier to twist it off. Which means you don't have to struggle. Correct. Right, because there are Correct. certain jars that take a bit of effort to open, yes. and you need all sorts of tools and stuff like that to get it open. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you know, it's the kind of, it's that that age old question or problem. You know, how do you open a jar? I know, you know, here here in the in the U.S., we you know, it's kind of ingrained into our culture, whether it's you know, in the comic strips or, or TV or movies, or, you know, it's always somebody banging that jar on the counter or, you know, the comedic joke, uh, you know, where they're breaking that jar. And, you know, so, and, and it's, and it's a lot, or it's introducing or informing the public that there are other choices out there, as opposed to just, you know, this is the way that we have to do it. So we just struggle through it. You know, it's us educating that consumer, uh, you know, and, and introducing this, this new technology to say that, there, that, you know, there are other options out there. Now, uh, the $64 question is, are you planning to introduce this uh, globally? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, we are. Uh, the Easy Lid is patented, patented worldwide, uh, and we do have plans of, of introducing this uh, worldwide. We're actually uh, going to be attending the uh, PLMA International Show this uh, May 29th to June 1st, I believe. Uh, it, it'll be in Amsterdam. Uh, so we will be over there with, with the Easy Lid technology for, for any companies that would like to, to stop in and, and see the technology, try it out, uh, uh, and, and, and obviously continue the conversation. Uh, but yes, we also have a team of brokers that, uh, that we're working with worldwide to, to, to launch and introduce this. Now, uh, we just actually commercialized the Easy Lid. We got our technology center up and running last year. So we are, yep, just working through, uh, through the pandemic, uh, you know, as, as, as sanctions and everything are opening up and meetings are allowed to start taking place. Uh, we, you know, we are getting out there and, and, and starting these meetings back up in the conversation. Is, is CCT planning more innovations? Uh, you know, we, we do... Uh, and that's why our company name is Consumer Convenience Technologies. We do uh, plan on uh, having other potential items or brands as we move forward. But but right now we are focusing on uh, uh, with the jar lid technology. Uh, currently we offer it uh, in the 63 millimeter size, uh, but we have plans to expand out to the 58, 70, 82, and 100 from there. Okay. Well, well Brandon, thank you very much for your time. Uh, well, thank and, you very and, much. And, and we'll be watching out for CC2. Thank you. <laughs> greatly, greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. And now let's talk to economist Saul Eslake. Well, Saul, what's your outlook for the economy? I mean, you've got uh, warnings of a recession in the U.S. with inflation there at 9.1%, the Fed uh, raising rates, and uh, there's all sorts of warnings of recession over the U.S., and in Europe. What's your view about this? Well, the downside risks for the Australian economy are clearly increasing. I don't think a recession in Australia is the most likely scenario for the next 12 to 18 months, but the risks of that are obviously growing. If we look at Europe and the UK, the risks of a recession induced by a combination of sharply higher energy prices, higher interest rates, and in the case of the UK, higher taxes, is probably now over 50%. The risk of a recession in the United States as a result of higher interest rates and a more sharply rising tax burden than is generally recognised are probably also getting close to 50%. And that does present a significant dark cloud on Australia's horizon, we might draw some comfort perhaps from the fact that two of the last three recessions that the US has had after the tech wreck in early 2000 and during the global financial crisis in 2008-9 weren't followed by recessions in Australia, although that was in large part because of the offsetting stimulatory impact of rapid growth in China's demand for a range of our commodity exports. 
looking at China today, it's unlikely that China could play that role again to offset the impact on us of recessions in the US and Europe, given China's ongoing economic problems, even if the relationships between Australia and China were better than they actually are. So the overseas influences on Australia's economy are certainly going to be a headwind for us over the next 18 months or so. Domestically, the biggest risks arise from the Reserve Bank's determination to bring inflation down from what it expects will be a peak of around 7% at the end of this year to its target range of 2 to 3% by 2024. And in pursuit of that objective, the Reserve Bank has raised interest rates by one and a quarter percentage points already and seems likely to raise them by a similar amount between now and the end of the year. That would represent a very significant increase in interest rates, the largest increase in rates probably since uh, the late 1980s, although, of course, not to a level anything like that if the cash rate gets to two and a half percent by the end of this year as i think it will that would still be low by historical standards but it would nonetheless inflict a considerable amount of pain on those people who took out mortgages when interest rates were at record lows and took the governor of the reserve bank phil low at his word when he said that rates would remain at those record lows until 2024 at the earliest I think it is highly likely that we'll see a significant slowing in domestic spending as well. Indeed, that's what the Reserve Bank is seeking to achieve in order to make it harder for businesses to pass on the cost increases they're experiencing to consumers in the form of higher prices. But I think there's probably enough momentum in the Australian economy and household balance sheets in aggregate are sufficiently strong and the tightness of the labour market sufficient to keep Australia out of experiencing negative growth over the next two years. But we'll definitely see economic activity slowing. We'll almost certainly see residential property prices falling across the country. And we'll probably see the unemployment rate tick up a bit from the current 48-year low of 3.5%. The issue, though, too, is that unlike the US, a lot of Australian borrowers are on flexible rates. Uh, That's true, and that's one of the ways in which monetary policy works. Uh, Although the proportion of Australian mortgage holders who are at fixed rates has apparently risen to almost 40% over the last couple of years as a result of the large number of fixed rate mortgages that were taken out during 2020 and 2021, when the long term rates off which fixed rates are priced were unusually low, as the Reserve Bank Deputy Governor pointed out this month, that does mean that some of those borrowers are going to face significantly higher repayments when their fixed terms expire. Uh, Some of that has started already, of course, but there'll be a significantly greater amount of it in 2023 as well. So uh, there's a significant cohort of borrowers who will feel the pain of higher weekly, fortnightly or monthly repayments, though the Reserve Bank also points out that only a third of Australian households actually have debt. And of those households that do have debt, about about two thirds of the debt is owed by households in the top 40% of the income distribution, whereas households in the bottom 20% of the income distribution only account for about 5% of total debt outstanding. And many households have been making mortgage repayments ahead of their contractual requirements during a period when interest rates have been at record lows and thus don't necessarily have to increase their repayments as interest rates rise. Now, none of that's to say that there won't be any pain or that there won't be a significant number of Australian households who are going to have to make some meaningful adjustments to their spending patterns in order to absorb those increases in interest rates. But as I say, that's how monetary policy actually works in practice in order to achieve the stated objective of bringing inflation 
back down to the Reserve Bank's target over time. Do you see inflation actually coming down to 2 to 3%? Well, not in the short term, and the Reserve Bank's been at some pains to say that they're not trying to bring it back down to 2 to 3% immediately. But I think there are some grounds for being optimistic that inflation will actually fall next year, provided, of course, that the conflict in Ukraine doesn't broaden and add renewed upward impetus to the prices of energy and a range of food products. One of the original sources of the increase in inflation that's occurred around the world over the last 12 months has been the disruptions to supply chains for a broad range of durable goods that have their roots in in COVID and restrictions that were imposed in different countries in order to stop its spread. And there is, I think, now increasing evidence that the imbalances between supply and demand that gave rise to those supply chain disruptions are now resolving themselves. Shipping costs, for example, which rose by more than 400% during the first two years of COVID have now started to come down quite significantly. There's a range of survey evidence pointing to an easing in many other upstream prices. And with the exception of energy, it would seem that quite a lot of other commodity prices are now also well off their peaks and starting to come down. So that's an encouraging sign. Provided commodity prices don't go up further again, what has been a contribution to higher inflation from rising com commodity prices over the past 12 months or so will start to drop out of annual inflation rates. And given, as we said earlier, that there's a very strong chance that Europe will fall into recession and probably a 50-50 chance that the US will fall into recession, weaker demand for a range of goods globally will also tend to put downward pressure on inflation. One potential advantage that Australia has in this context is that unlike the United States, the UK, and to some extent New Zealand, wages haven't played any role in driving Australia's inflation rate up. And as a result, our inflation rate hasn't been as high as it has been in those in some other economy. So it could well be that the Reserve Bank doesn't need to tighten monetary policy as aggressively as some other central banks need to do in order to achieve its objectives within its stated time frame. That said, uh, one could expect that the demand for higher wages will now be increasing with rising inflation. Well, it probably will, although I think it's still notable that although inflation has more than doubled over the period between the middle of last year and March, which is unfortunately the latest data we have. We don't get June quarter data until Wednesday of the coming week. Uh, wages growth as measured by ABS statistics still hasn't breached 3%. It probably will over the next 12 months because of the tightness of the labour market. But given that interest rates are rising, and given that the unemployment rate probably will drift up a bit from its current 48-year low, I suspect that that is going to act as a break on how fast wages are going to rise from what has been, admittedly, a very low level of growth over the last five or six years. Well, that's all quite fascinating. Saul, thank you very much for your time. That's a pleasure, as always, Leon. So what's happening in the news? Well, the International Monetary Fund has said the global economy could soon be teetering on the brink of a recession, amid evidence that the world's three biggest economies are all stalling and inflation is higher than previously forecast. The International Monetary Fund has significantly downgraded its outlook for the global economy for the second time in just three months, as inflation and rapidly rising interest rates stymie activity. In a downbeat update to its April World Economic Outlook, the IMF cut its growth forecast in 2022 and 2023, and raised the prospect of a more pronounced slowdown. It said problems in the US, China and the Eurozone had resulted in global output falling in the second quarter of this year, the first contraction since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Washington-based IMF said it now expected the global economy to grow by 3.2% in 2022, a 0.4% reduction since April. The slowdown is predicted to continue next year, when growth is now forecast to be 2.9%, 0.7 points lower than had been pencilled in three months ago. 
The UK is forecast to grow by 3.2% in 2022 and by just 0.5% in 2023, cuts of 0.5 and 0.7 points. The IMF expects the UK to slow down markedly in the second half of the year and to be the weakest of the G7 economies in 2023. And Australia's inflation over the year to June hit 6.1%, which is the highest level in 21 years since the GST was introduced. The Consumer Price Index from the Australian Bureau of Statistics shows that prices rose 1.8% in the June quarter, which was slightly below the March quarter inflation rate of 2.1%. The most significant contributors to the rise in the June quarter CPI were new dwellings, 5.6%, and automotive fuel, 4.2%. And global car manufacturers are calling for mandatory emissions targets on themselves and warning the slow take-up of electric vehicles could leave Australia with less choice and, in the worst-case scenario, mean some right-hand drive models are unviable. Confidential research, authored by S&P Global for the Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries, which represents the major car companies, shows EVs will still only make up 76% of all vehicles sold in 2030 if the federal government does not move to accelerate their arrival, because only 18% will be electric-only vehicles, the estimate shows. Before the May election, Labor said it would remove taxes on EV vehicles and set targets for government fleets, and suggested that modelling showed 89% of new cars would be electric by 2030. But the FCAI, in its discussions with the government, has warned the key issue is the availability of EVs, with manufacturers prioritising exports to regions with stricter emissions rules. In a far-ranging proposal put to the government, recommends emissions targets be placed on the manufacturers to push a greater supply of EVs to Australia. The modelling by S&P Global forecasts only 12% of cars in Europe, 17% in China and 35% in North America will have an internal combustion engine by 2033. In South, in South Asia, a key vehicle sourcing region for Australia, that figure will be 63%, leading to less electrification headed to Australia. And consumer confidence gained 0.7% last week, following a 0.2% increase the week before. The latest ANZ Roy Morgan Australian Consumer Confidence Survey shows. And the mainland Chinese market, once a gold mine for Australian winemakers as local drinkers filled their glasses and banquet tables with more than $1 billion a year in Australian wine, has been crushed to become just a titular $25 million market following years of political tensions and punishing trade tariffs. Year-on-year -year exports to China last financial year have collapsed by nearly 96% to 24.6 million, ranking at about the same size in terms of Australian wine consumed as Sweden and only slightly more than the Muslim nation of the United Arab Emirates. The latest export figures released by Wine Australia have revealed that in the wake of tariffs slapped on Australian wine by Beijing in late 2020, as of as much as 218%, the China market has gone from Australia's biggest wine export destination to one of its smallest that now only buys 1% of wine exports. The average value of Australian wine sold into China now has also collapsed by 65% to an average of $4.09 per litre to, to totally destroy a once buoyant market that could devour as much Penfolds Grange and other luxury, luxury premium wines Australian winemakers could send off to the Asian giant. A multi-billion dollar Melbourne developer Caden Property Group, whose projects include the redevelopment of the famed Nilex site in Cremorne, has collapsed in the biggest private developer failure since Raylan and Stella. Insolvency specialist McGrath Nichol said Matthew Hutton and Matthew Caddy had been appointed receivers and managers of Caden by Asian based non bank lender OCP Australia, which holds security over Caden's assets and properties. OCP Asia was also a financier of the Stella Group, which collapsed in 2019. And car manufacturing giant Ford has struck deals with Australian miners, including BHP and Rio Tinto, to secure supplies of critical battery materials to power its transition to electric vehicles. Mining giant BHP announced on Thursday it had signed an agreement with the US automaker to explore options to supply nickel from Western Australia to for EV batteries. Anglo-Australian mining giant Rio Tinto also announced a partnership with Ford for supplies of lithium, low-carbon aluminium and copper. Under the deal, Ford said it may become the foundation customer for Rio's large Rincon lithium development in Argentina once it begins production in coming years. Ford said on Thursday it had secured enough battery minerals from various deals around the world to produce 600,000 EVs by late 2023, a jump from 27,140 battery-powered cars it sold last year. And as global sales of electric cars rise, automakers are racing to lock in scarce supplies of key raw materials such as nickel, cobalt and lithium needed to build millions of electric batteries. 
The forecast supply crunch sparked a stunning rally last year in lithium prices, one of the building blocks for EV batteries. Australian lithium minnow Ionia also announced on Friday it had signed a more advanced binding agreement to supply Ford with lithium from its flagship American lithium boron mine in Nevada, once it is expected to begin production in 2025. And the federal government will move to gut the controversial construction industry watchdog of its powers this week in a decision set to spark a fresh battle between employers and unions over worksite intimidation tactics and productivity. Workplace Relations Minister Tony Burke had flagged that the Australian Building Construction Commission would be defunded before Labor introduced legislation to disband it, but he announced on Sunday that its remit would be reduced to the bare legal minimum and its most ridiculous powers, as he put it, would be scrapped altogether from Tuesday. The Commission is the most recent iteration of a building industry watchdog and was created by the Coalition Government in 2016 to tackle lawlessness in the construction sector. It pursued prosecutions against the militant CFMEU construction union and other unions and enforced the building industry code. The code covers a list of rules specific to the building industry for government-funded projects and includes right of entry obligations, collusion and compliance laws, limits to the display of union insignia, such as flags, and restrictions on workplace agreements. Employer and construction groups said the shock move would jeopardise the economic recovery by delaying and increasing the cost of vital infrastructure projects, and the opposition said that Labor had once again capitulated to its CFMEU paymasters. The unions, however, hailed it as a move to restore equity and fairness to the building industry by removing measures focused on wage suppression, as they put it. The code banned several controversial provisions from inclusion in workplace agreements. Immediately, the unions gave notice that they would pursue conditions banned at the building code. These include paying labour hire workers the same as full-time employers performing the same work and infringing on managerial prerogative by stipulating, for example, who can and cannot be employed on a site, such as the number of apprentices and casuals. And the Albanese government faces a struggle in the Senate to abolish the Australian Building Construction Commission, but is prepared to defund the watchdog should the legislation fail. And even without the funding threat, the ABCC would still operate with limited powers as the legislation failed because the opposition cannot muster the numbers to disallow the regulations which have been used to gut it. At the end of the day, the government was prepared to strip the ABCC of funding if need be. Labor pre-election costings contained plans to savage the ABCC's operating budget this coming financial year, identifying $28 million in savings from the watchdog's $35 million budget. The savings increased to $36.6 million in the 2025-26 financial year, equivalent to the Commission's entire budget. And West Farmers retail chains Bunnings and Kmart have paused the use of facial recognition technology as the Australian Information Commission oppresses its investigation over privacy concerns. Earlier this month, the Office of the Inf Australian Information Commissioner opened investigations into personal information handling practices of both chains, focusing on the company's use of facial recognition technology following a report from consumer advocacy group Choice. The good guys, um, electronics and white goods retailer JB Hi-Fi, in late June paused the use of facial recognition technology in its stores while OAOC investigated. Perth-based West Farmers bowed to the pressure to stop using the technology at the weekend after Choice released names of large retailers that do not collect and use such biometric information, including Coles, Woolworths, Aldi, Meyer and David Jones. Farming and business groups and a former top diplomat to Indonesia have backed keeping the border open with Australia's northern neighbour, warning an overreaction to the foot and mouth disease outbreak risks $500 million in trade and could be as damaging as the 2011 live cattle ban. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese warned that shutting the border could damage two-way trade and insisted the federal government had introduced the strongest ever biosecurity measures to keep the disease out of Australia. Albanese pushed back at calls from opposition frontbench MPs, including Karen Andrews and Barnaby Joyce, to consider shutting the border, arguing that if we do that, then there, of course, would be a response. Now, Australian airports are being ranked among the worst in the world for flight delays and cancellations, putting them in the same categories as London Heathrow and Amsterdam's Schiphol Airport. On-time performance for June, compiled by aviation analytics site OAG, ranked Melbourne, Australia's worst at 631st, behind Schiphol at 658, Toronto's Pearson Airport at 653, and Heathrow at 642. Sydney Airport came in at 597, the Gold Coast at 587, Perth 4, 567, and Brisbane 524 in the comprehensive list of international and domestic gateways. According to the OAG data, fewer than half of all flights departing from Melbourne took off on time in June, and 8.1% of services were cancelled. In Sydney, 54.5% of flights departed within 15 minutes of schedule, and 7.1% were cancelled. 
travels out of Brisbane fared considerably better in comparison, with 63.4% of flights taking off on time and fewer than 5% were scrapped. And the $2 billion agribusiness group Elders is partway through a $25 million investment in a new wool handling business, where a large facility on the outskirts of Melbourne will have 22 electric driverless vehicles helping to move wool bales. Under the codename Project Casino, the 35,000 square metre facility will be up and running at Ravenhall in outer Melbourne by mid-2023. The Ravenhall facility will have seven charging stations for the electric autonomous guided vehicles. The driverless unit will be operated through a high-tech software network, which is part of the $25 million in capital spending. And more than half the country is now experiencing declines in property values. That is according to a suburb-level analysis from PropTrack. The biggest declines in Sydney through the June quarter were houses in Malgoa, Western Sydney, 22.72%, units in Tarrant Point, Southern Sydney, 22.11%, and units in Manly, 20.44%. In Melbourne, it was houses in Danyong South and the South East, 20.86%, houses in Red Hill, 20.36%, and houses in Flinders, 19.34% both on the Mornington Peninsula. Prop Track Director of Economic Research, Cameron Cusher, said the property market in Sydney and Melbourne had already been slowing before interest rates rose in May. Interest rates have increased 1.25% in three months. In Hobart, the data showed units in Battery Point, just south of the CBD, declined the most in the June quarter, 20.58%. In Adelaide, it was units on the coastal suburb of Hove and Grange, 16.14%. Units in the Canberra suburb of Watson declined by 22.89%, the largest across the capital cities, and houses in Griffith declined by 22.42%. Houses in the affluent Perth suburb of Peter Peppermint Grove dropped by 13.34%. Houses in Larrakia, an inner suburb of Darwin, saw a 20.60% decline, and units in Birkdale, Brisbane, declined 22.69%. And Australian companies are less sophisticated than their overseas counterparts when it comes to adopting artificial intelligence, new report says. The Committee for Economic Development report says AI is still in the early phases of implementation in many Australian companies and industries, with only 34% of firms using it across their operations. The report points to Stanford University's Artificial Intelligence Index, which shows Australia's private investment in AI was valued at US $1.25 billion, that's $1.8 billion Aussie in 2021. Up from just shy of 300 million, US 300 million in 2020, this marked the biggest yearly jump since 2014 and put Australia ahead of South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Spain and Portugal. However, Australia remained well behind France at US 1.55 billion, Canada at US 1.87 billion, Germany at US 1.98 billion, Israel at $2.41 billion, the UK $4.65 billion, China $17.2 billion, and the US $52.8 billion. And fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic is expected to fuel a surge in class actions because the crisis would have masked fundamental business weaknesses, industry veteran John Walker says. Mr Walker of litigation funder CASL said that election of the Labor government would help the pension swing back in favour of those seeking to lodge class action claims. CASL is cashed up after recently raising $155 million for the claim, so it will only be run in Australia. The bulk of the funds came from offshore institutional investors and will be invested over the next two years. In 2012, 17 claims were filed in Australian courts. This rose to a high of 62 in 2020, coming back to 53 filings in 2021, amid uncertainty created by coalition plans to limit the amount that would be paid to litigation funders and lawyers in class actions. And that's it for this week. And next week, I'll be talking to James Brown, CEO of Smart Communications, a leading technology company that helps businesses engage in more meaningful customer conversations. Smart works with top Australian government agencies and highly regulated companies, and James can discuss the current customer experience landscape he's seeing in the country. And I'll be talking to economist Nicholas Gruen. In the meantime, you can catch me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. And if you want, leave a comment. Wishing all the safe.